Well, good day, everyone. This is uh, Chris with the Ancient Scholar. I know it's been a while since my last video. Uh, I'm still pretty busy uh, with my studies in school, and I actually hope to graduate with uh, this other degree uh, in August, the end of August, beginning of September. Um, and I'll probably make a video on my experiences with online education good, bad, and ugly, and I'll probably be making that after I graduate. I'll be doing a very frank and honest assessment of my experiences uh, relating to online ed education. Um, we just finished finals week at the college, uh, so obviously the last couple of weeks have been really busy. I um, was able to graduate uh, one of the first classes of advanced emergency medical technicians. Uh, from Doniana Community College. Uh, my class ended up doing exceptionally well on both their finals and the National Registry Psychomotor Examination for uh, the AEMT, which is, is, as some of you may know, very different um, than the older, the, um, the EMT I-85. You know, there are a total of about nine skill stations that they have to go through, and a tenth will be added um, toward the end of the year. Um, so it's definitely a bit more stressful, a bit more involved in testing, and uh, they will be going on as of June 1st to take the National Registry uh, Computer Adaptive, adaptive Test. Uh, so I'm real proud there. I also graduated uh, several students uh, from an EMS from our EMS Pharmacology class, one of the prerequisites for the paramedic program. Uh, had a lot of fun there. Um, and uh, the respiratory therapy program, uh, class of 2012, graduated. Um, and see, all, I believe, 12 people that made it to this year ended up graduating. Um, they really put in some incredible effort. They took uh, the self-assessment uh, self -assessment test uh, that the, um, I believe, the uh, NBRC um, sends out or at least our colleges purchases that, and it kind of gives uh, everyone an idea of how well you would actually do on the CRT board exam. Every student passed quite well, um, so we're really confident that, that they'll do, at least they'll do very well on their CRT. I imagine the written uh, registry as well, and of course they're working through Kettering um, and, and getting ready for the, uh, the clinical sim examination as well. Okay, so what would I like to talk about today is something that's all over the news, and uh, it's certainly something that's very dramatic, um, and this is something known as necrotizing fasciitis, or to the lay people, um, a lot of people call it uh, quote-unquote flesh-eating bacteria. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, uh, thoughts, uh, definitely my thoughts, and, and um, um, just kind of thoughts and prayers go out to uh, the student. Uh, I think she's a 24-year-old um, uh, female uh, in Georgia that end it ended up uh, getting a really, a really bad case of necrotizing fasciitis and has lost um, at least one of her limbs, and they suspect other limbs uh, due to the, the fasciitis itself and then the subsequent um, septic shock that she's developed um, following that. So she is, is, is apparently in pretty rough uh, shape and um, I guess there's, there's, there's an improved outlook at, at this point for uh, at least her survival, but uh, re regardless of um, uh, the, the mortality in this case, uh, you know, her life is definitely, her, her life, the quality of life has definitely changed um, pretty significantly. And um, you know, regardless of whether she survives or not, she's going to have significant challenges. Um, so, you know, if she does survive, still thoughts and prayers go out because um, you know, she's going to have a lot of challenges ahead of her. Um, so, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk a little bit about necrotizing fasciitis and kind of what it is, and um, just kind of um, you know provide a little little additional information for people. So. What is necrotizing fasciitis? Well, it's life-threatening, obviously. It is a rapidly progressing um, infection um, that uh, produces, generally produces a, um, a significant inflammatory process. Now, this infection differs from what we call a run-of-the-mill skin infection called cellulitis, where you know I have an infection of the um, uh, the outer layers of the skin, the the uh, the, the dermal layer, and, and perhaps into the subcutaneous tissue. 
uh, necrotizing fasciitis actually occurs, you know, um, deeper than that, and it actually it, it involves what's known as a fascia. And if if you remember from your basic anatomy and physiology, you have you, know, you have your outer skin, your epidermis, you have your dermis, um, and your your subcutaneous tissue, your fatty tissue, and underneath that, you have what's known as fascia, and, and fascia kind of is a connective tissue that covers muscle compartments and muscle muscles are divided into you know different compartments in in your extremities and even your core of your body um, by this fascia and that's really where necrotizing fasciitis occurs is in in the fascia along the fascia and even you know into muscle and in the fascial compartments and deeper structures okay so it's very deep um, and it can spread very easily um, up the layer of fascia, uh, you know, within hours in some cases, I can have um, significant spreading of this occur uh, through the fascia of the limb. Um, it rapidly destroys skin and soft tissue beneath it. Um, obviously, some people call this flesh uh, eating bacteria. Um, the, the proper name is necrotizing fasciitis, it causes necrosis of tissue and it is an inflammatory and infective process of, of the fascial planes themselves and obviously that allows it to spread very quickly um, depending on who you talk to there are they divide it into to different types differently um, I, I just I divide it into three types to make it a little easier to understand there's type 1 necrotizing fasciitis which is a polymicrobial infection um, it involves multiple species of a bacteria. Generally, uh, gram-positive and gram-negative um, bacteria are involved there. Then there's what's known as a type 2, and this is really the most common type. And this involves um, <coughs> a beta hemolytic streptococcal bacteria. What is beta hemolysis? Well, if you remember from molecular biology or microbiology, um, uh, hopefully you, you had to do uh, something called a CAMP test, a hemolysis test, on blood auger and there are basically two types of hemolysis there's alpha hemolysis and beta hemolysis alpha hemolysis when you look at the at it it's what's known as an incomplete hemolysis and you don't have complete and total destruction of all the red blood cells in the auger beta hemolysis results in complete and utter uh, disintegration disappearance of all the red blood cells around the bacteria um, that you've cultured and then there's also something called gamma I think it's gamma hemolysis where there's really no hemolysis at all, so I'm not even going to talk about that. But it's the, the, the group A strep, the beta hemolytic strep, so it causes um, total hemolysis. Um, this, this is actually the most common um, cause of necrotizing fasciitis. And then we have the type 3, which is very pretty rare, actually. Well, necrotizing fasci fasciitis isn't particularly co common in the first place, but this is a type 3 very rare, and this is a, a, a marine vibrio gram negative rod, and I believe this is a type that the, the girl in Georgia has. Um, she had a fall on a zip line, sustained a deep uh, laceration of her leg in, in, a, in a, an aquatic environment, and um, so I believe that's a type of necrotizing fasciitis she has. Okay, how do you get it? Well, um, generally you have to have some sort of deep cut. Um, in some cases, it's idiopathic, and there really isn't a well-known or an identified uh, path of injury. But, but generally, the, the bacteria has to get into the body um, somehow. Um, the entrance can be, you know, relatively minor. It can be like a pinprick, a, a puncture, or a paper cut. Um, can sometimes enter through a weakened area, like an abrasion or a bruise. Um, and, and the good, the big thing to know is it can happen to anybody. Um, regardless of how how good your immune system is, how old or young you are, and you actually see this happen fairly frequently to people who are relatively healthy, otherwise um, don't have any other underlying problems. Um, there are some risk factors, or what we call cofactors, if people are diabetic, if they're uh, chronic alcoholics, they have immunosuppression, they have severe uh, illness such as uh, coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathies, congestive heart failure, liver failure, uh, renal failure, and so on if they're morbidly obese. Um, but these are not clear cofactors, and, and that is to say that even healthy people um, frequently or co can get this. It's not particularly common, but you know it, it, it does occur in healthy people.
um, quite, quite frequently. So what happens, the bacteria gets in, they eat away at the tissues and the skin and can penetrate into the muscle. Um, obviously, this you know, creates a, a large inflammatory response by the immune system. Typically, these patients develop what's known as SIRS or systemic inflammatory response syndrome. The bacteria can release toxins. Um, you have pro-inflammatory substances being released, like cytokines, um, and of course cytokines in, in, in kind of impede the phagocytic um, action of immune cells. Um, this allows bacteria, like anaerobes, to thrive in this necrotic environment because you don't have the fat phagocytic cells, uh, uh, specifically macrophage uh, or monocytes, become macrophage, go in and kind of clean the area up. You have damaged endothelial tissue, increased capillary permeability occurs with that. Um, obviously, the blood blood supply um, is um, inhibited. Um, it is compromised. You have increased inflammatory response. The immune system can't really work properly, and it's very difficult to get antibiotics, even given IV, to penetrate into those infected areas because the blood supply is compromised. There's so much inflammation. You have edema that occurs, hypoxia, hypo hypoxemia, hypoxia of the tissues, and more necrosis. Um, eventually, the necrosis will involve the subcutaneous tissue and even um, the this skin proper, if you will. Um, signs and symptoms are variable, uh, flu, nausea, vomiting, uh, tachycardia, um, skin can become tender and red. It can be very difficult to identify necrotizing fasciitis uh, simply because you, you do a physical exam and what you see externally doesn't really indicate what's going on internally. In severe cases, you can actually get gas that's produced, gas pockets, um, and, and crepitus that occurs as a result of that, but that doesn't always happen and that's you know, that's a late, late indication. Um, sometimes you can get pain, lots of pain that's kind of out of proportion with what you see. Um, and actually, this leads to a delay in diagnosis and treatment of um, necrotizing fasciitis. Um, and that's actually what looked like happened in this girl is, you know, she started having lots of pain and they didn't really, it, it took a while to recognize that, that this was necrotizing fasciitis and, you know, a delay and even an hour's delay can be critical in these patients because the treatment for necrotizing fasciitis really involves surgical debridement. You need to get them um, into the uh, operating theater. You need to open them up. You need to aggressively debride um, the dead tissue, necrotic tissue. Um, generally, you'll have to go back in within 24 hours and do uh, another debridement and even more de debridement after that. It's very aggressive. Um, if you wait, obviously, preservation of the limb and life um, can be difficult. Uh, morbidity and mortality is very significant in necrotizing fasciitis um, simply because it's difficult to treat. It often goes unrecognized, and by the time you get to it, it, it has become a very extensive problem. Uh, so uh, mor mortality is anywhere from 30-50%, I believe. Uh, it's associated with septic shock. If septic shock develops, obviously. Um, that's even a, a bigger issue with these patients. So uh, after we radically debride them, if the patient is hemodynamically stable, uh, some uh, do recommend uh, hyperbaric oxygen treatment. Sp specifically with anaerobic bacteria, they do tend to respond um, better to um, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. There isn't a whole lot of evidence out there that suggests it improves morbidity and mortality greatly, but it is a... Um, potential uh, consideration, and then obviously um, intravenous antimicrobial therapy, um, and then, you know, rehabilitation, skin grafting, um, prosthetics, uh, and all the other long-term care that goes into that after we've taken care of the initial infection. Okay, guys, so this is a really brief introduction, and, and hopefully um, I was able to, you know, provide you with a little information about necrotizing fasciitis and kind of what it is, and hopefully... Um, I was able to reach people. Um, I really wanted to reach people that that perhaps aren't medical professionals by doing this um, this video. So I kind of wanted to keep the pathophysiology uh, pretty relatively easy to understand. Okay, guys. Um, as always, thanks for hanging in there.